All right, with that, um, we're gonna move into the uh, member and public comment uh, uh, portion of our uh, meeting. This is an opportunity for folks who would like to speak uh, about any uh, particular issue uh, confronting the Bar Association. Bar Association. I will look at uh, virtual hands and call on folks. If uh, for whatever reason you're on the phone or otherwise, I, Executive Director Nevitt, if you have a line open to identify folks on the phone or how do, how do we handle those people wishing to comment? Rex, can you remind us what the um, things are to put on their phone to raise their hand and unmute, please? Star nine to raise your hand, star six to mute and unmute. Thank you. And someone hopefully will tell me when um, that happens and I can uh, recognize people accordingly. Uh, I see two hands up, um, uh, Mr. McPherson and uh, Ms. Cotton, um, both of you welcome to our meeting. Uh, I'll recognize Mr. McPherson first and then Ms. Cotton. Actually, I probably will just toss this to Jean. During your executive session, I called Jean because I, I knew that she was uh, supposed to be in court this morning and she may probably have to run off uh, to be a pro tem. But there was a change uh, in the court rules suggested by Supreme Court uh, for CR 71. And Jean, just nod your head if that's what you're going to talk about. She knows a whole lot more about it than me. So I think I'll just pass it to Jean. I will have some comments about the bar exam issue uh, at one o'clock. My machine for some reason doesn't show a raise hand button, but I figured there's a way to do it on my keyboard. So I'll talk about that at one o'clock, but I'll pass this on to Jean. Thank you, Mr. McPherson. Ms. Cotton, or should I say Judge Cotton? Well, yes, but today I miss. <laughs> Thank you. Um, sorry, I haven't seen you guys for a while, but I've been watching you from afar. Two real quick issues, both involving rules. Um, and while I may not have been in attendance at BOG meetings the last couple of times, um, I have been following you know, your minutes and your agendas and the issues in case something came up of significance. I haven't seen um, one of these, another one I've sort of seen in a, in a strange way. The one I haven't seen that I think is critical right now there is a proposed rule change to CR 71 that affects withdrawal of attorneys. It, it, the GR 9 indicates that it was submitted by the SCJA and in, in, to the court in December. We just found out about it on draw um, earlier this week, um, just kind of passed the radar. Um, and the comments are due by April 30th. My concern is multiple, however, I don't recall this ever coming to the board or going through the court rules committee. And, and this is a serious change, which ha would have devastating impact on particularly solo practitioners. And so I just wanna give a heads up to the, the BOG and to President Schichetti in the hopes that maybe you guys can jump on this really quick with the rules committee and take a look. Um, Draw is going to submit a letter to the Supremes of comments that's that's pretty hefty, um, but it, it's it's interesting read. I won't go into anything further. You guys can read better than me. The other is a rule change that is resulting from, and I know you've had presentations from the AOC folks on the new case management system that's Odyssey-like that they're going to be implementing over the next several months for the courts of limited jurisdiction. This is really in my wheelhouse now that I'm a judge for the Municipal Court of Hoquiam. Um, but they are mandating the, the local courts to do a local rule um, with regard to this new system. And the gist of it is this, <clears throat> they are charging a fee, they're going to mandate e-filing regardless, and they are charging a mandatory fee of $5 per filing. And you have to use either a credit or a debit card. So there's also a two to two and a half percent surcharge because of that only on private attorneys. It, the, the exempted people are government entities. So that would be your prosecutors, law enforcement, like extreme risk protection orders and such. Um, any kind of legal services organization like Northwest Justice, um, an indigent pro se defendant or petitioner and the petitioner for a protection order. Doesn't say anything about exempting the respondent. 
Um, this is really a, not only a due process, uh, but an issue of, of unfairness. Um, and I think it's serious and, and the letters have come out to all the lower court judges uh, with a draft model rule um, that is offensive. It is contradictory of other rules um, such as uh, CRLJ5, um, CRLJ1.2, um, and the, the coordinating CRs. Um, so I think both of these are something I hope the board will get the rules committee to jump in on. Um, they're concerning. So that's what I have to say. I do have to run. Um, I have a hearing here in about 20 minutes that I have to get all ready to go for. Um, and I'm doing everything by Zoom these days. So I got to put on my robe for Zoom. But mm -hmm. good to see you all. Thank you for letting me speak and stay well, everyone. Got my shots. Thank you, Ms. Cotton. And uh, maybe perhaps uh, if you could coordinate with uh, Executive Director Nevin on some of this information so we could take a closer look, um, that would be great. Thank you for bringing it to our attention. Ms. Hawkins. Thanks. Um, one of the issues that we had was also with regard to CR 71 um, and trying to figure out where it came from to given that the first we hear about it, it's got a deadline of about three weeks and from when we first heard about it in the material. So I don't know why that wasn't on a prior agenda or somehow more analysis done, but CR 71 changes would be very problematic for family law attorneys. So the family law section um, will also be trying to comment. Um, certainly the rule is written from a judicial point of view without much um, understanding of how adversely this can affect um, attorneys. So we would ask, uh, I don't know if there's some explanation from the Board of Governors as to why it hasn't come up before. Um, we too, just as uh, Jim said, will have comments on a number of items along the line in the agenda. It is very difficult to raise those comments at the beginning when it's not in, as part of a full discussion. With regard to the rules issues coming up, uh, especially the discipline rules, you're aware that there's a great deal of opposition to those proposed rule changes. And it's, so it's raised an issue for us as to the need for a policy with regard to sections making comments on rule changes. Uh, whereas there had to be, there was a lot of concern about a policy that would prevent the legislature from receiving differing comments from differing sections. The Washington Supreme Court is certainly aware we have differing sections. I think they can handle receiving comments from different sections. So we would ask that a sections, comp, uh, a, a policy be put on the agenda, proposed policy be put on the agenda for discussion in a future meeting so that we can have a section's comment policy with regard to rules that differs from the one that apparently exists from the 2015 um, policy. Thank you, Ms. Hawkins. Mr. McPherson. Uh, Kyle, I was trying to lower my hand. I'm going to do that now. I, I can't figure this out without having a button. So All right, I, your, hand is, your hand is lowered. Thanks. All right, I am not seeing any other virtual hands. Do we have anyone on the phone that uh, has identified a, a, a issue that they wish to address? Not hearing any? I don't see any. <laughs> Oh, I do see a hand. Um, I only see part of your name. So Betsy Liu, uh, do you have a comment? I'm, Madam, uh, Mr. President, I'm um, 
I am the WSAJ uh, liaison, and we will have comments later with respect um, to the ODC proposal. Um, we also are preparing, but I have not yet uh, been authorized to speak to a couple of the other rules issues. Um, but I'm assuming at that point we'll be given the opportunity to speak. Yes, absolutely. The uh, ODC I, um, issue, I believe we're talking about it approximately. Well, we have uh, reports of standing or ongoing bog committees first, and then that will follow that. So there will be an opportunity for public comment. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, I'm going to glance through and see if I see any other actual raised hands so that I can cover everyone. Not seeing any. All right, we will go ahead and close. Uh, oh, I do see one, uh, uh, Ms. Limerick. Um, thank you, Mr. President. I'm sorry, I just now joined. Um, I do have a comment that I would like to share, but I'm happy to reserve that until later. It's specific to the uh, proposed resolution on the bar exam. So um, you can simply let me know if it would be preferred to have that shared now or to wait until later in the agenda. You're welcome to share it now, and if you'd like to comment further uh, later on in the agenda, there will be an opportunity for that as well. Very well. Okay. Um, then I will proceed. Um, good morning. Uh, my name is Eileen Limerick. I'm a past president of the Filipino Lawyers of Washington, and as an active member of WISPA, um, uh, I serve on the uh, currently serve on the WISBA Equity and Diversity Work Group, as well as a member of the WISBA Member Engagement Work Group. I want, to, I want to make this comment to help the board fulfill its commitment that WISBA made in its guiding principles to operate a well-managed association that supports its members and advances and promotes diversity, equality, and cultural understanding throughout the legal community. I join the minority bar associations and the numerous individual members that adamantly oppose the proposed resolution on the bar exam. I took the time to watch the video of the March Board of Governors meeting in order to try to better understand the reasoning for this proposed resolution. I realized that as a body that this board spent a great deal of time over the two days discussing this topic. And at the very start, the question was posed, why take the action now before the task force has had a chance to do anything? I was wondering the same thing. And many of the individuals that will be online today are wondering the same thing. The responses given seemed hollow and disingenuous and included some of the following. The Board of Governors has an obligation to speak on these important issues. The Board of Governors cannot just sit on our hands. That's going down a similar path as the mandatory CLE board path. This resolution is uniquely well-crafted. It aligns with the Board of Governors past position and diploma privilege and Board of Governors position as a defender of a required bar exam. While this is our current position, that could change later. And there is no need to propose, postpone the resolution. This board is elected by the membership and that's how we take action is through our votes. Supporters of the resolution suggest that this body has a position on diploma privilege and the requirement of a bar exam. Yet I am doubtful that this board has more knowledge about the history of using standardized bar exams, more experience with the use of diploma privilege or more objective data about the impacts of the current bar exam on examinees of color than the task force that has been created by the Washington State Supreme Court. So why would the board presume at this point that it's appropriate to put forward a resolution that declares a position when it is clear that there is a great deal of discovery and analysis yet to be done before a truly informed opinion can be formed? Instead, I would suggest that WISBA focus its resources and efforts on supporting the task force in the unique way that only this organization can help educate the general membership on this topic, provide creative pl public platforms to disseminate information about this issue, and also gather questions, comments, concerns for the purpose of providing the members input to the task force. 
It was suggested during the March board meeting that the discussion on this topic has been long ongoing and that the BOG is well informed on this issue of the importance of a bar exam. But with an issue as critical as this, I expect that the WISBA be open to the naked truth that none of us here are well informed on this issue, not yet. In a letter dated June 4th, 2020, our Washington Supreme Call Court called for the legal community to recognize and acknowledge the existence of systemic racial injustice. They said, it is the collective product of each of our individual actions, every action every day. It is only by carefully reflecting on our actions, taking individual responsibility for them and constantly striving for better that we can address the shameful legacy we inherit. We call on every member of our legal community to reflect on this moment and ask ourselves how we may work together to eradicate racism. So I ask, please take this time to reflect on this moment and consider how best to represent your constituents and vote no on this resolution so that the task force can proceed with its work objectively and without impediment. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Limerick. Um, and we will be talking about that particular issue um, right after lunch. Um, so there'll be further discussion then. All right, any other additional public comments? Uh, scan one more time. Not seeing any hands, actual or virtual. And so I will go ahead and close public comment. Thank you, everyone who uh, uh, chose to speak. We'll move next. Well, let me let me gauge the the audience here. Do we need to take a break? We've been going for about an hour and a half. Uh, nods, shakes would be helpful. Five minute break. We are it's uh, we're right on time. Why don't we take a five minute break and then we'll come back at uh, or a six minute break. Ten forty. Thank you.